make sure we're mic'd up here. Uh, we'll call this meeting to order. Thank you so much uh, for coming for our first Banks and Banking uh, Committee meeting. And I want to thank especially our members. Uh, I want to remind you that uh, we're in a new process here uh, with uh, webcasting going on. And I say that just to remind us all that uh, any background noise uh, can be picked up. And it's very important that as we proceed with our committee meeting uh, here today, uh, during the process, if you wish to be recognized for a question, uh, if you look on the panel in front of your microphone, there is a button uh, there, and you'll have to mash that button. If you'll press it when you desire to be heard, then it'll light up the, the uh, box up here. It'll let us know. But if you don't press that button, then what you say may not be heard through the webcasting. Uh, the Georgia Legislative Network. So please, in an effort to make sure that everybody's heard, uh, make sure you press that button and uh, then we'll hear your comments uh, in, in the most fair fashion as possible. Uh, to begin uh, our committee meeting this morning, uh, or this afternoon, I've asked Representative Mike Cohen if he would to uh, open us in a word of prayer. Thank you, Representative Cohen. I would ask you to uh, remember uh, Representative Johnny Floyd's wife, uh, Judy Floyd, who had surgery yesterday. Representative Shaw, could you give us an update on that? Certainly understandable, and uh, if I could, I'd like to ask, uh, we've got several meetings uh, that are going on at the same time today, uh, and Representative uh, Calvin Hill, Chairman Calvin Hill, has got a uh, committee meeting that he needs to go and present a bill to, so I'd like to ask if we could, rather than uh, discuss our, our new committee rules first, if we could just go straight to the bill so that would free up uh, Representative Calvin Hill to go and present his bill, uh, and we'll go ahead and take up uh, House Bill 864 first. And since that is a bill that I introduced, I would like to at this time uh, turn the, the chair position over to temporarily the vice chair, Representative Calvin Hill. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, we had a special subcommittee that was commissioned last year to study the question of motor vehicle tidal ponds. Uh, we met a couple of times during the break, and we met once since then, to look at that question, to look at various bills that were out there, presented our findings to the entire subcommittee and to the committee, and as a result of that, uh, Chairman Mills has introduced uh, a substitute bill to the one that he had last year, which is LC 340529S. And that's a bill that he'll be presenting today. This was approved with a uh, unanimous due pass resolution or recommendation from the subcommittee. Uh, Chairman Mills, if you'd tell us about your bill, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if you'll notice in your folder, House Bill 864, the, uh, the House Committee on Banks and Banking offers the following substitute is a bill in which I'm referring to, and it, it basically deals with two issues, uh, one of which we uh, initially spoke of, uh, which the bill included to begin with, and that is that when someone goes to uh, get a title palm uh, at a particular title palm store, uh, if the amount is, we will say for sake of example, $500, and the vehicle happens to be worth 10000 then uh, the vehicle has to be repossessed. Then when the vehicle is sold, the excess amount of that after the loan is satisfied has to be returned to the person who had the vehicle repossessed. That was the way the bill initially read. 
it still reads that exact same way. We've not made any changes in that, in this bill. The one change we have made is what I'd like to present to you today, and this actually came through a process of, of our hearings uh, over the interim. And that deals with line 15 on page 1. Uh, and you'll notice uh, in your folder there should be a chart uh, which has uh, an actual real-life illustration of someone who may have gone to a title pawn uh, store and pawned their vehicle title for the amount of $500. And if you'll just make reference to that, I think this will help as we explain this bill. But uh, in essence, this is a forced principal reduction uh, in the legal terms of this bill that we've changed by 5% after the uh, third extension, the third month extension. As you know, under current Georgia state law, when a title pawn is issued for the first three months, a title pawn business can charge up to 25% amount. Now, through the study committee, we discovered that those were rare occasions because the free market process is at work. I walked into one in my county and uh, they didn't know who I was. They offered me a 12% a rate uh, beginning right off the bat. So, so uh, other people had that same experience, but uh, we took the highest example and, and listed it uh, on your illustration here. If a title pawn is left for the first month and then it's renewed the second month and then it's renewed the third month, after that third month, under current state law, they can only charge 12.5% as a maximum. Well, if you'll notice on your, on your illustration sheet that I put in your folder, if the amount was for $500, the title poem, you see at the bottom column it has the monthly payment amount, which would be $125 for the first month. The second month, if they extended it, now they could pay it off, and a lot do, as we heard from our studies, but if they don't, it, the, the second month the payment is again $125. The third month, it's $125. The fourth month, under my legislation, and that's what this illustrates, is the language on page one. Then uh, the fourth month, the payment drops from $125 to $87, but you see a, a mandatory payment, if you'll look down on the left-hand side of your illustrated payment form, that mandatory payment is actually a principal reduction. And that is, the bill is worded such that after that third extension, if they extend it the fourth month, then the business must apply at least 5% of the payment toward the principal. And what this does is it keeps somebody off the interest treadmill forever. And uh, I think this is a good measure uh, included in the wording in the bill. Uh, it gives the title pawn owner the option. He could say at that time, I understand, all you have is, uh, let's see, according to this illustration, all you have is $62.50 and you to pay the interest. You don't have the mandatory payment principal reduction, which would be $25. The owner has the option of moving that $25 over into a principal owed column. But he cannot continue to charge the customer accrued interest on that 5%. Now, he could repossess the car under the current agreement. But, uh, you know, we've spoken to both customers and folks in the title pawn industry, and uh, we think this is a fair, uh, fair approach. And that's what I brought to the, sub the study committee that was appointed and uh, was voted out, and now it comes before the full committee there. And, uh, I'm, I'm sure there are probably some questions, Mr. Chairman, uh, but I'm, I'd be glad to answer them at this time. Okay. Thank you very much, Representative Mills. Uh, I think that's a pretty good explanation, but I, I noticed we have some questions. I think Representative Mills first. Yeah. Representative Sink, I believe you were. If you press your button, please. Um, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, how, what is the compounded interest over there? For, for the loan. Yeah, I, I'm assuming what you're asking for is an annual percentage rate. Right? Yeah. Is that yeah. right? The APR under this legislation is no more than what it is under current legislation. As a matter of fact, uh, 
this is actually, it could be a, looked at, and some view it that way in the industry, as a, a backdoor rate cut because it is applying a principal reduction and on that principal reduction amount there cannot be interest accrued. So if, if may I follow? Yes, ma'am. So if you apply the principal reduction, what does that what does the APR come out to? Do you know that? I have not run the figures on that. Can anyone answer that? I'm sure that, that could be answered if you take somebody with a calculator and uh, knowing how to figure APR it would be uh, I, I can tell you this, it would not be any more. Uh, let me ask, uh, if I could, Mr. Chairman, Legislative Council. Uh, I know we're asking you a banking question here. Uh, am I correct in saying it would definitely not be any more? It's not going to change the APR amount. Of Representative Sinkin, perhaps I can answer it. Sinkfields. Sinkfields, excuse me. My mind is, I'm almost presenting my other bill. Excuse me, I apologize for that. Um, through the public hearings that we had, and we did something a little different than I think the most subcommittees, I asked our subcommittee members to actually go out into to pawn stores, walk in as the chairman had, without identifying yourself first and talk to the manager, and then after identifying yourself, Ask them perhaps even if you could talk to some of their, their clients if, if everybody was okay with that. Many of us did that. Plus we had at the first hearing probably 40, 50, 60 consumers. The, the real concerns that came out were the two that were to, are being addressed here. One, repayment of, of any overage in the case of a, re, a uh, repossession. And the second one, never out of all of the people that talked and as the interest rate the APR been the concern. The concern is that they've been paying on it for two or three years and they owe as much or more than when they started. It's been that treadmill. And as it was our charge to find out what the problem was and what the consumers felt the problem was, and we thought those were the only two that were really mentioned out there, and that's why those two were addressed. So this, and I have no idea what the APR is. It's certainly less than it would be than it was yet today if this is passed because we're reducing that amount each and every month starting with the fourth month. So it does go down. And I'm not an actuarial, actuarial specialist, so I can't tell you how much, but it will be a decrease. But it seemed that the primary concern of the consumer and our desire to protect that consumer is to make sure by the end of that uh, 23rd month, if they were to make those minimum payments and you see their payments go down every single month, they will not owe a penny. They will be off that treadmill of debt and they will have a decreasing payment every single month, which under today's system would not happen. They'd be paying their $125 a month forever. And we want to help the consumer get away from that. So we didn't do it in the compounding or figuring the compound annual interest at all. Okay. Representative Jackson. Well, Mr. Chairman, I have a question addressed to uh, Chairman Mills. Um, Chairman Mills,
Bill, you stated that you walked into a title farm and they gave you 12% interest and they didn't know who you were. It, am I to assume that if, if I walked into that same title, uh, title farm store, I would get 12%? Or does it vary from customer to customer? Or is it, is it some other reason you got 12% and some other people may get 25%? Uh, Representative Jackson, I, you know, I did not identify myself until they offered me what they were. I showed them my vehicle and I asked them what would be the rate uh, of the interest charged if I were to get a title poem on that amount. Uh, I couldn't answer that question. Uh, you know, I would hope that I'm sure each business operates according to their own business rules, and, uh, but I would assume that, and, and what the lady at the counter told me was that this is our starting rate for people uh, with a vehicle over and she gave me a, I believe a date. They had, a, this biz, particular business had a car model date that they were basing the rates on. If you had an older car, I think the rate was probably going to be higher. If you had, uh, depending on the year of the model, but each business has different models. So I couldn't answer that, uh, that question. I'm answering you as honestly as I know how. I mean, I, I don't know how they run their business. I just walk in by one. So we're not addressing the issue of, of high interest. We just, you know, we're not going to address the issue of uh, uh, interest rates being 25% for some consumers and 12% for others. Well, I think the free market dictates that. Uh, and I think that is, uh, you know, for each business. I'm sure you can go to a business down the road who's probably charging either higher or lower. It depends on the amount of business they're going after. And what I found is that when you had several of these title column businesses in the same general location, there that the rates were lower in most, most cases because they were competing for business. If I could add, Mr. Chairman, to do with that, there is one company, and I'll name them only because they advertise it. It's Title Max. I think they have 120, 130 stores throughout the state, which is a fairly large footprint. They advertise 9.9% to everybody. So it's, it's flat out. We did find that in, in our examination. Perhaps if there was one that was totally isolated, they might go for the full amount because they have no competition. But in most areas, especially when there's more than one store, we found the, the rates to be far, far, far below the maximum that the uh, legislature had set when they initiated this program. Is there any other questions? Representative Hall. I don't know the answer to that question, Representative Holmes. I'm sure you could figure it based on what you said. The first three months is 25%. The remaining months must go to 12.5%. Now, uh, you know, this is my personal opinion. I think, and I stated this, if you remember when this bill originally came up, uh, that I don't think it's apples and apples when you're talking about APR, that's annual percentage rate. And what we're talking about here is a system that for three months charges 25%. Now, I think in order with the federal guidelines and keeping the laws that are currently in place, they have to actually put on the documents 25% times 12. So it looks like an enormous 300 and something percent interest rate. When in reality, as we have discovered by studying this, 
That is not a true picture of the situation because for the first three months it's 25. Then it goes down to 12 and a half. I think what we're talking about here is how people run their businesses. And, and for me, it's, a, it's a, for me when I run a business, it's pretty much bottom line. I treat everybody the same. Uh, no. Representative Holmes, what I was responding to was one specific situation, and I was asked a specific question. In an effort to be totally honest, I gave a totally answer, uh, a totally honest answer to that question. I have no idea how people run their business. They have to run them under the current law. And, you know, if we suspect that discrimination is taking place, then somebody should bring it against that particular business. That's a whole separate issue. What we're framing here is a, a framework of the law for them to work within. And I agree with you. Everyone should be treated the same. I would also say that as a businessman, if somebody comes in, it doesn't matter what their background is or what color they are. If they have a vehicle that is not as worth as much money as someone else, then my risk is higher if I loan them more money on that vehicle that is, doesn't have as great a value. That's the only point I'm making. Thank you very much, Representative Holmes. And be before we take a couple more, maybe I'll give a quick background on exactly what the subcommittee did because we are going over some of the same issues. We went looking for problems. We went to places like the con governor's office and consumer affairs. We went to um, the legal offices at the military bases, places where we've been told to look for potential problems or abuses. Um, Department of C Consumer Affairs, Never, they had a few complaints investigating them. The complaints were not valid. People didn't have their facts right. Um, the same happened at the military bases. We were quite astounded to find so very few complaints. We could not document a complaint that had validity to it. We're aware of that one instance where a vehicle was sold more than the other, and we can see that's a potential abuse, so we addressed that. Of all the other people testifying, and the people that the subcommittee went out to see, Again, interest rate was never mentioned as a concern. The concern was, gee, I might have to pay for this for many years to come without reducing my principal, which is why those were the two issues that we brought forth as our findings. The others just didn't exist as, as questions. And to answer your other question, nobody on the subcommittee saw any pattern. Like we said, one company that has stores sprinkled throughout the state, 
uh, quite a few stores, 120 approximately, at 9.9%. Regardless, I think that's uh, a pretty good indication of how the market you know, place is working. And I'll be quite honest, I was surprised. I thought we'd saw, we would see a lot more at the cap, but it, it appears to be just that, a cap that very few people are following. So that's good clarification. Mr. Chairman, if I could just insert at this point, one of the things that we discovered through this process uh, of the study committee, we heard that what we're talking about here, beyond the third month extension on title palm loans, that this is 6% or less than the business that they do. So only 6% or less go beyond these months, according to what we heard. So what we're talking about here is it's important for us to make that note that it's 6% or less uh, is who this is going to affect. So uh, contrary to what we, what we thought when we began this, uh, it was much less after we studied it. Okay, I believe Representative Scheid is next. I believe, uh, was that Representative Gordon was, who did you have on your notes? Representative, Representative Gordon. Representative Jordan, I'm not sure that I do, but let me okay. just. Let me. I want to make, make sure I'm clear on this. You don't believe the call that I've received on this. If a person takes their car in as to be pumped for a certain amount of money, time. Uh, all right, for, and the, within five months, they are not able to pay back the full amount of the loan. The loan company, the title fund company, decides to sell the car. Then let's say the car is worth twelve hundred dollars. 
If I understand your question right, that's what my bill addresses, that extra money is returned if there is overage once the loan has been satisfied to the original owner. That's, that's exactly what I want to make sure this bill addresses. Because I will admit, this type of business is needed. I, I don't question that at all. There are those who can't walk into banks. But at the same time, they need to be treated fairly. And taking money that Let, if I could, uh, let me just say that when, when an agreement is signed by the title poem business and the customer, they have agreed to terms within that 30-day period. And, you know, like any other agreement, if I make an agreement with you and I fail to keep my terms, then I'm liable. Uh, and you have a right to pursue to make sure that those terms have been kept. And I think what this does, in, in some rare cases, and again, we found out that uh, through the study that, that it's these title call companies, contrary to what people think, they're not making money on repossessing cars. If you look at the cars that are often repossessed, most of them have a value of less than $500. And it's a hassle for many of them to go through the problem of go finding the car, repossessing the car, that costs them money, all of that, and, and then having the car repossessed, and they're they've been falsely portrayed in a lot of situations. And uh, I think it's important that we present both sides of the picture. And while, if I understand your question correct, my bill addresses your concerns and it allows that overage to go back to the owner of the vehicle. The loan has to be satisfied from the amount that's sold, but the excess goes back to the person. Is that a certain procedure? I have a follow-up. I have another question. Excuse me, before I do it, let me turn this over to our secretary, David Knight. I have to go and Representative Jordan, yes, go ahead and proceed. Is there a certain amount of time in your bill that this money has to be returned back to the, the consumer? As soon as it's sold has to be returned. And let me, uh, if I could, let me lean on legislative counsel. Uh, the question was, is there a certain amount of time that uh, even under current law, and I want to make sure the correct answer is given. Let me get you. So I'm correct in saying this bill tightens the law. Thank you. Yes, that's a good question. On page 2 of the bill, uh, line 29, where it says, plus the expenses of repossession and sale actually and reasonably, and there's your important word, reasonably incurred by the pawnbroker. So someone would have grounds to come against that business if there were unreasonable fees charged there for the sale of, let's say, if somebody said, hey, I'm going to charge you $6,000 for auction office fee, that's clearly unreasonable. Yeah. Yes, 
question goes to Chairman Mills. Chairman, you mentioned that uh, only 6% of uh, people who go into a title farm go beyond three months. That That is what was reported to us from the uh, the title farm industry. Now, uh, of course, there are many, many people that we discovered who go into title farm businesses and uh, let's say they're, they're handymen, they're subcontractors. He wants to build a deck on the back of somebody's yard he, or the back of somebody's home and he doesn't have the money so he goes, he title pawns his vehicle for $2,000, $1,500. He gets the money to go build the deck and then that is paid back. So there are many, many people in many different fields of life that use it in that way, and repossession is never an issue. The money is paid back. And when all that's factored in, what we just what was reported to us was 6% or less. I'm sure that would vary in areas. It just seems kind of low. It, it seemed, I agree with you, Representative Jackson, it seemed low to us too, but I, uh, in, in our interviews and in checking with other title farm businesses. I ran into that figure. I ran into 2%. I ran into 3%. I never ran into anything over 8 or 9%. You know, you have to average all those in, of course, to come up with a 6%. So, in your estimation, 94% of the people who go to a title farm business, you paid that loan within three months. Well, that wouldn't be my <coughs> estimation. That would be what was shared with the study committee. Uh, Representative Sinkler, I'd, I'd be glad to, uh, uh, but in an effort to uh, let you know that I'm not being biased anyway, I want the best bill. I want to ask our, our legislative council to start, if you would, and her question is starting at the top of page three, just to make sure in layman's term that we all understand uh, what I'm trying to do with this bill. Which is, which is current law, and let me, if I, if I could, could I get an up for a moment? Uh, let, let me just, 
I want to try to answer your question as clearly as I can. And I, uh, what I described earlier uh, remains intact, but what I, what I want to build on is there are no new added fees. And I can understand by glancing at page three how you might think that. But if you look, uh, all of that is current law. Uh, the only thing that has changed is the underlying portion of this bill. Uh, there are no fees that have been added. The only thing that is added is a clearer definition where you see if a pledger or a seller redeems their motor vehicle after possession, that's just clarifying who the pledger is, the person who took out the, the uh, title poem loan, the seller, the title poem uh, person. And the same thing on line 17. Again, that's just clarifying who that is. On line 22, uh, when it says when count under the uh, three eyes, is this um, repossession fee, is this pertaining to more from the origination, the distance and the amount, is that what's the relationship here? It um, is. Representative Sinkfield, you're correct. That is current law. All of that is current law. And frankly, I'll be honest with you, if, w what you're talking about, line 17, it says uh, a repossession fee of $50 within 50 miles of the office. Now, I don't own a title palm business. I don't have any investments in the title palm business. But I would not want to operate under those terms. Well, if you had to repossess a vehicle 50 miles away and could only charge $50, well, you know, let me, let me just be kind if, of if you'd clear. let me respond, I would appreciate it. The reason it. I'm asking this is because I think there seems to be an assumption that all of us know what the current law is. I don't know what the current law is. And that's why when everybody says the current law, that really had no meaning to me because I don't know it. For those people who already know the current sure. law. Well, is this helping? Yeah, what, that's why I'm asking you Sure. What, what part what? of the did, I mean, I, I tried to explain all that that I know to explain. Did that answer your question? Well, we, can we just keep going? Sure. With D? With D, which is current law, is if a, pe a pledger or a seller requests that a pawnbroker mail or ship the pledged item to the pledger or seller, a pawnbroker may charge a fee for the actual shipping and mailing costs, plus handling fee equal to or not more than 50% of the actual shipping and mailing costs. So what would they be shipping by? I mean, I'm sorry. You talking about the title? Well, I mean, uh, what? I thought they would already have the title. If, if they have to... Um, I would imagine that would be picking the car up uh, and repossessing it. Which is current law. I mean, we're not changing any of that. Thank you, Representative Knight. Uh, Representative Lackley, did you have a question? Uh, that would the proper time for that motion would be now. Is there a second? No, sir, this is the product of, of really two hard, long meetings and a lot of study. I, I appreciate, you know, you're your offering that, but at this point, I feel like we've got some agreement on this, and I'd like to move forward. Fear of changing anything at this point would, I'm afraid, kill it.
All right, I appreciate that, but if you remember what, what I said when I was answering question was, um, this has been referred to as a backdoor interest rate cut because it's a forced principal reduction, which means less interest being paid in the long run. So it, so it really is an interest reduction in reality sense, but it's not in, in the terms of reducing the percentage on, on a piece of paper. But as far as what's coming out of a gentleman's wallet or a lady's wallet, it will reduce that amount. All right, Representative Scheid. Thank you. I think with the posture we stand in right now, is there's a motion been made? Uh, is there a second? Uh, the bill is, let me make sure the second is Representative Howard Maxwell. Uh, all right. Uh, and, and others. Uh, motion has been made and been seconded. All in favor of passing uh, the committee substitute House Bill 864, say aye. Aye. All opposed, say no. All right. Uh, it seems to me that the eyes clearly have it. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, the Committee on Banks and Banking reports out House Bill 864. We have one other quick item on the agenda, and that is uh, because of the webcasting, uh, I'd like for us to consider uh, some rule changes that I put in your folder there. And I want to thank the members of the committee for, uh, for enduring that discussion. I think it's healthy that everybody had a fair right to ask their question and, I, and, and appreciate your votes on both sides. Uh, let, me, let me just say that uh, on the rules, they should be in your paper, and I don't want to be elementary with you, but uh, quickly all they're doing is rule number eight uh, has been added, and uh, it just asks us to, you know, cell phones and things of that nature. But with us being on webcasting, we need to be uh, even uh, place more attention on that and make sure we don't have cell phones going off. Then number nine, again, is self-explanatory. Uh, and I would just ask you, uh, this is not a rule, but I would encourage you just uh, as all of us, when, when we're having a committee meeting, it'll be helpful rather than have someone just approach you in the middle of a meeting and aid. If you would make sure that that's been approved ahead of time because if they're walking in front of the camera, uh, Representative Holmes may be speaking and somewhat your aide may be accidentally walking, blocking his view. So that's all that does. Uh, any questions? Can I get a motion to adopt these rules? So moved and seconded. Is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All right. These rules are adopted for this remainder of this session. <laughs> Let me just, if I could, before we go, I, I want to introduce, uh, first of all, we have a new member on our committee, Representative Clay Cox uh, is a new member on our banking committee. Glad to have you. And then also, uh, I have uh, an intern who's an aide going to be helping me, uh, and not just uh, any aide. She's my niece, so you'd be especially nice to her. Ashley Bell, would you stand up in the back? So if you see Ashley, she's going to be helping me during the session. And then also, uh, if you're here today and you have interest, you represent uh, concerns with wire transfers. Uh, Representative Tom Rice's aide is going to remain behind with me. And Alan, he's holding his hand up. We'll meet over in the far corner. If you have concerns with wire transfers, uh, we'd like to speak with you briefly. Meetings adjourned. Thank you.